Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to Growers Daily, your daily dose of ecological farming insight. It is Monday, June 2nd, 2025, and today we're going to talk about the month of June, why pests are likely only going to become more of a problem, and what causes plants to just stop. So let's do it. All right. Well, welcome to June, everyone. Uh, So this episode that you are watching currently is going to be a little different than other episodes because, well, it is not actually June 2nd when I'm recording it. It is actually Sunday, May 25th, but that's just between us. And you can tell maybe because I had a cold that weekend, as you will remember. Essentially, uh, we knew that Mike was going to be out of town. So we actually recorded this one all the way back in May. So he could just take the day and I could uh, take the day and you could still have a fun daily because for many of us, we're still out in the fields working and why not have something to, to new to listen to? Uh, this week, I will in fact have a couple guests on the show the next two days and it will be amazing. And then back to our regularly scheduled programming on Thursday and Friday. Does all that work for you? awesome. Uh, But other than the fact that it's not live this week, so if there is some news this week that I would normally comment on, I will save that for Thursday. Anyway, other than that fact, it's still going to be a normal show. First, uh, June is a big month in farming around here, and most of the continental U.S., some indigenous tribes uh, have called it the moon of making fat, and for good reason. So long as there's uh, rain, June is the time when the ground is absolutely erupting with grass and weeds. Uh, and life. Uh, The word abundance comes to mind. Although June is definitely abundant, it is not necessarily when we get our biggest harvests out of the ground. That's usually July. However, it is absolutely when we are most focused on replenishing the gardens after that first round of crops, whatever those were, keeping the garden under control, starting to think about fall crops and just trying to keep stuff alive for the more often than not first blazing hot days and weeks we will see this year. June is also the month where uh, we pull the garlic and sometimes the onions and potatoes at least by the end of the month. So in that way, the harvest is big. But in terms of the weekly harvest, our tomatoes do not really kick in into you know high gear until July. Ditto peppers. Uh, then we will also have those storage crops plus, you know, like potatoes and such, uh, plus the weekly large hauls of squash, lettuce, all the things. But for June, while we are at our peak sunlight, the solstice is the 20th, also known as the longest day of the year and also known as John Goodman's birthday, fun fact, at which point this will be this, you know, this whole entire place will be bathed in sunlight for an obnoxious amount of time for someone who has to keep their lettuce happy all summer. And also for someone who goes to bed early by basically any standard already. All that sunlight is not my favorite thing, but the garden loves it. Also, I find that time after the solstice to be an interesting one because the sunlight slowly starts to dwindle, uh, even though it's like the first day of summer. But by August, it really begins to dive. June is often a relatively dry month for us, though uh, when it's not, it's, it is really hard to keep up with the growth. So if it's a wet month, it is just growing like wild. Uh, so I almost prefer a drier June in some ways, though I guess when push comes to shove, I will always take any amount of rain pretty much headed into July and August. Late June is the time when if we plan on doing Brussels sprouts and longer season uh, broccolis and cabbages and that sort of stuff for the fall, we will get those started in late June. Of course, for those of you in colder regions, that may sound about right or even a little bit late. Those of you in warmer regions may, may be like, what? And because you generally have to wait a little longer. Now, those long season brassicas don't normally hit the field until July anyway, if, you know, for how slow they are to grow in the seedling trays. But we will often start them in June anyway. Uh, those crops are a challenge for us only because we do not have the cool nights they they like here in Kentucky. They just never gets cold at night. We just have like hot, loud, humid nights and almost nothing but like crickets, cicadas, frogs, toads, and mosquitoes and bats enjoy. I will start one more round of tomatoes in June because the market is still after them in early fall when everyone else's tomatoes have kind of stopped or blighted out. Watermelons too, uh, sweet corn if I'm feeling spicy, but of course, uh, those two I mostly just grow for ourselves because there is, as we have often discussed, almost no profit in them. I will likely get one more bed of potatoes in as well. Later, potatoes under mulch at least tend to do well here. Anyway, that's what June is looking like around here. What uh, what say you? What is What does June look like in your neck of the woods? But except for you down in Australia who you're like, yeah, it's winter. We're just hanging out. Anyway, let me know and we can chat about that on Friday for Feedback Friday. Otherwise, we're going to take a quick break. And when we return, is all insect netting all the time the future of farming BRB? Today's episode is brought to you by Farmhand. 
I started a CSA to grow food and build community, not to drown in admin work. Spreadsheets, emails, and pack lists take up too much time. If I could spend less time at my desk and more in the field, that'd be a win. Enter Farmhand. Farmhand automates billing, newsletters, websites, and member support, saving CSA farmers 20 plus hours a week. Focus on farming, not paperwork. See how Farmhand can help. Book a one-on-one demo with founder Ari at farmhand.partners slash no-till. That's farmhand.partners slash no-till. Today's episode is also brought to you by Precip. Precip is billed as the easiest way to keep track of rainfall, and that is true, but it is a lot more than that. Sure, you can open the app and immediately see accurate rainfall totals, but you can also save locations to see historical rainfall totals, wind speeds, and all sorts of other nerdy details. Their radar-based technology means you can ditch the rain gauge. I usually have to do that anyway because the kids find a way to uh, smash it with a baseball bat. You can ditch the rain gauge and start tracking rain in other growing conditions all on your phone. Click the link in the show notes to find out more. All right, back to the show. If you, the listener, are enjoying this podcast, getting even a small amount of value from it, consider supporting our work over at patreon.com slash no growers. I will try to get to questions from everywhere that questions come in, but I will always get to your Patreon questions. Now, today's Patreon question comes from Patreon member, author MK England, who writes, quote, this is more of a topic suggestion slash commiseration than a question, but I've been despairing lately at how many formerly reliable crops now require insect netting to even have a chance at harvest. My latest heartache was having my entire onion and garlic crop decimated by a new invasive allium leaf miner fly arriving in central Virginia brought over from Europe. Look it up if you haven't, y'all. Nothing to do about it but cover with insect netting. Peppers used to be an easy win, but the last two years pepper maggots have meant insect netting netting is a must. Cabbage loopers, squash bugs, it feels like I'm careening towards a future where everything has to be grown in a low tunnel under netting. What will be next? I have a thriving community of wasps, spiders, and birds, and my soil is better every year. But on a farm as tiny as mine, even minor losses are a huge deal. Thoughts on the future of pests, constant insect netting, etc. Thank you so much, Jesse. Really appreciate you and the no-till growers team, end quote. Okay, so awesome. Thank you. Uh, great question here. This is very interesting. Not that long ago, I talked about the importance of biodiversity and certainly Certainly, the pest control is a huge part of what is lost as our world becomes more ecologically homogenized. Effectively, as our biodiversity dives, the opportunists, like many pests, thrive. In a sense, you don't have a plague of locusts. You have a deficiency of birds, bugs, and mammals, and all the things that keep locust populations in check. Now, there are other factors at play beyond the loss of biodiversity, but they are also uh, somewhat related. For instance, warmer temperatures are contributing to an increase in uh, certain pests like the codling moth, uh, uh, the peach twig borer, the uh, oriental fruit moth. That Those are things that affect like almonds and peaches. And you may ask if those insects are increasing, why are other insects not increasing with them? Like why are their predators not growing? That's all. It sounds like a lot of food. And the answer is mainly the host plants. The plants that host pests are a lot of the plants that we grow. Conversely, the plants that host their predators are the plants and trees and shrubs that we clear out for buildings or more of those same plants. Does that make sense? So we're growing more of what the pests eat and less of where their predators live. Warmer winters and earlier springs with hotter summers means that those uh, pests also have a leg up in beating their predators to the punch. Their geographical area expands into places that may not quite have the equal populations of predators to keep them down. Uh, warmth has a lot to do with uh, the increase, but interestingly, uh, according to some research, quote, insect populations in tropical zones are predicted to experience a decrease in growth rate as a result of climate warming due to the current temperature level, which is already close to optimum for pest development and growth growth while insects in temperate zones are expected to experience an increase in growth rate and quote basically in already warm regions pest populations may actually decrease as it gets too hot this of course is a bad thing in a good thing package because uh, you still need insects just preferably a good ratio of bug eaters to crop eaters so for temperate regions pests will likely increase while their predators uh, decrease due to a lack of habitat in tropical regions maybe pests decrease but so too do their predators due to um, you know, warmth and uh, lack of food. All that to say, careening is a good word for, to use here. It does feel like we, at least in temperate zones, 
are indeed careening towards a future where we have to protect everything on a much more significant scale than we used to. Now, doesn't uh, healthy soil ward off pests? Well, yes, it certainly can help, but even healthy soil is not always operating at its optimum, like in the spring when it's too cool or in the summer when it's blazing hot. And as I've said before, plants need time to establish in soil, healthy or not. They need that time for the soil to start uh, helping to them, the plants, to defend themselves. Thus, why I like to have so many birds and bugs around all the time to fend off the pests while the plants get going. For certain abiotic stresses, those are abiotic, just meaning like non-biological ones, there is only so much the soil can be expected to do. Heat, drought, pests, infestations, uh, floods, hail. I mean, healthy soil is amazing and it can help plants have access to the microbes and nutrients they need to fend off pests. But the soil is not like a miracle worker. It's not like plugging a lamp into an outlet and suddenly you have light no matter how, you know, no matter what the conditions are. You know, the soil requires care, moisture, good timing, you know, of the planting, uh, available nutrients, rich microbial abundance, and so on. The land needs all of that in right proportions for healthy soil to work its magic. This is why this podcast is so much more about ecology than just living soil. The environment around your gardens matters to production. Full stop. If you have healthy soil and poor ecology, you will not necessarily have great production. These things are all related. So anyway, as I have emphasized many times on the show, we have to stop handing our environment over to materialistic politicians who are at best apathetic towards nature, who don't understand it or care about it at all or see their connection to it. Uh, 100%, that has to stop. The environment needs to be a centerpiece of our economy, not an afterthought, not an inconvenience, not a resource, the absolute centerpiece. Uh, that would help with our pest issues tremendously and diseases and droughts, among other things. Otherwise, the future is indeed probably just more insects in low tunnels until those probably cease to work. June is a great month to plant a bunch of flowers, though. So at very least, you can literally do something towards making a difference like this month. Uh, anyway, cheery stuff for this Monday. Let me know your thoughts and we will discuss those on Friday, I'm sure. Otherwise, it's break time. And then why plants stop growing? BRB. Today's episode is brought to you by Precip. Precip is billed as the easiest way to keep track of rainfall, and that is true, but it is a lot more than that. Sure, you can open the app and immediately see accurate rainfall totals, but you can also save locations to see historical rainfall totals, wind speeds, and all sorts of other nerdy details. Their radar-based technology means you can ditch the rain gauge. I usually have to do that anyway because the kids find a way to uh, smash it with a baseball bat. You can ditch the rain gauge and start tracking rain in other growing conditions all on your phone. Click the link in the show notes to find out more. Today's episode is also brought to you by Peaceful Heritage Nursery. If you're looking for hardy and resilient fruit trees, berry plants, or pawpaw trees, then check out Peaceful Heritage Nursery. Peaceful Heritage Nursery LLC is a mail-order nursery shipping premium quality fruit trees and berry plants across the USA. They specialize in resilient, non-GMO plant genetics for small growers. Their diverse selection includes berries, cold hardy figs, passion fruits, gumi, mulberry, and much more. They're famous for their diverse selection of premium quality grafted pawpaw trees, five-star Google ratings, and customer testimonials attest to their commitment to excellence in quality and service. Find them at peacefulheritage.com and join the mailing list. Once again, find them at peacefulheritage.com. Use the promo code NOTILL for 10% off your first order. All right, back to the show. All right, so a question comes up from time to time that is like, uh, I planted X thing and it just stopped growing. What gives? So here are a few reasons why a plant may seemingly or just entirely stop growing. This can happen in the greenhouse or in a field, of course, but uh, the reasons are largely the same whether you're in the field or in the greenhouse. So let's talk about uh, the greenhouse first. Sometimes folks will get uh, something to germinate and grow it out only to find it completely arrested in the tray and maybe even, you know, starts to look a little less healthy or even die. None of those are necessarily more likely than the other, but the first reason this might happen is overwatering. Can the roots breathe? Pick up a block uh, out of the tray, smell it, feel it, see if it if it smells like manure or, or and or just feels like soggy, then it's probably the water. It's probably you're overwatering it. Allow the plants a little more time between watering. It could also be underwatering. Sometimes the top of the plant looks good to go, only to discover the bottom of the cells or the wind strips are completely dry. I find this is actually really common with wind strips. As long as if you're not bottom watering them, they're just really hard to water the bottoms of those cells. Reconstituting any tray can take a minute. So take your time to soak the bottoms until they are 
uh, fully saturated for several minutes for each tray and then uh, water slightly better and more often just in general. Now we have a Patreon member shouts to Brian Green, who is having a l issue like this uh, in the greenhouse that we will dive into later and suspects it's their well water, which is uh, high in salts that may be slowing the growth and they are uh, attempting to leach the trays to recover them, basically soaking the trays to flush them of those excess salts. Um, if you are on a well, it is never a bad idea to have that tested and chat with an agronomist about potential issues that could arise. Also, a filter is never a bad idea, you, even if you just uh, for food safety, you know, just to filter out any potential E. coli or whatever. Now, in the greenhouse, it could also just be nutrition. The soil mix is not rich enough or you are trying to grow the transplant to a larger stage than the basic soil mix can suffice. Or maybe it just doesn't have enough of that aeration element. That's why it's getting too waterlogged. A good soil mix should not have this problem, but it, it can happen. Uh, I like fish hydrolysate as a nitrogen supplement to get uh, plants through if that sort of issue arises. Uh, you may want to add a little blood meal to the next round of mix as well, especially if nitrogen is a problem early on, but you have a lot of mix to still use, you know, later on. Uh, you can supplement that mix a little bit with something like blood meal, which will give it a little bit more of a nitrogen boost. Now, the problems in the field can be the same. Too much water, too little, or not good irrigation water, potentially. I've seen uh, drainage stop a lettuce crop dead in its tracks, like poor drainage, um, before it really got going and then it yellowed and died. But the additional challenges in the field can be things like compaction, which basically means the roots reach a somewhat literal wall below ground, plus anaerobic pathogenic organisms love those sorts of environments, which may also lead to dead or stalled plants because of disease. Um, Stress in the field from heat or drought or potentially pests can cause a plant to slow down or stop growing. It may not always be obvious what the problem is at first, why the crop is stopped, or that the crop is even stopped. Sometimes they may just be hanging out looking okay before they suddenly start to turn yellow or start to wilt. Uh, the plant may be using its energy to fight off the pest or cool itself through evapotranspiration or whatever the issue may be, however it typically addresses it. Um, and look fine for a while, but be unable to grow. Then, of course, it may just not be super healthy, rich soil yet, and then the lack of available nutrients for a healthy crop, or conversely, excessive nutrients, could be the issue. That can definitely happen as well. We've talked about addressing compaction and drainage and poor nutrition, irrigation, and we'll continue to do so on the show as we carry on. Until then... Did I miss anything? Any other reasons you found that a crop just completely stalls out? Otherwise, uh, we're going to peace out for this Monday. Look for the two awesome interviews coming up the next two days. I'm very excited about both of those. They are going to be so awesome. You're going to love them. Super nerdy stuff. Don't forget that No-Till Growers is now officially a 501c3, so donations are tax deductible and greatly appreciated. Please make sure to like and or subscribe and or follow wherever you're getting this podcast. That's an easy way to help us out, truly, just like share it with friends, like it, subscribe, all those things definitely helps. Uh, enormous thank you to all of our show sponsors. And if you'd ever like to uh, sponsor this show, you can reach out to farmer Michelle at no .com. Huge shouts to Willie Breeden for the theme music, Mike Hilbert for the production help and editing and to the team at No-Till Growers. Also, shouts to Epidemic Sound for the background music that you can hear. Pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook of the Seed Farmer at notillgrowers.com to support our work. Big, big thank you to everyone over at patreon.com slash notillgrowers, where at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, or you sign up in the month of, well, now June, uh, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs today to Kyle Richardville, Patrick Weaver, Alex and Oliver, Bill King, and Chris Yates. Um, all right, in this week's story, well, there used to be this major, you know, highway running through this town, let's say in Kansas, uh, and travelers on that highway brought in like a ton of revenue to this town. But when I-70 was built like in the 1950s, suddenly the town dried up in terms of economy and basically uh, it became a shell of its old self. Trees grew up in the, over the town. Many of the people, uh, you know, left for, for like greater prosperity and the town slowly became even more forgotten. In fact, it more or less disappeared into the landscape and became hard to access for like a forest in the thicket that grew up around it. Um, so forgotten was this town that it doesn't even come up on maps. Forgotten, that is, by the outside world. But for a certain group of people, that town was still very much alive. And that is for tomorrow on the Kansantonians. That's a good name. I'm into it. All right. We will see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching and or listening. Bye. Everything was screwed.